You know, again, my apologies for not being as prepared. On That's beautiful, bro. Long. No, I, I mean, look, coach, I'm, I, you know, this is the way I am on the next guy. We'll go, we'll go right to him. Shamar Bridges. I, you know, I would rather you say, coach, I don't have a lot. I don't have a good feel for him than yep. to just sit here and blow smoke. I'm not that kind Shamar. of guy. You're not that kind of guy. Me so either. for Shamar Bridges, you know, I don't have, I don't have much on him. All I see is a big frame, biggest yes. frame out of all of them. And uh, some of the clips that I saw, our buddy Edgar Allen. I don't know if yes. you're familiar with his YouTube familiar, channel. Dude. He's great, dude. He's the most he's the most underrated guy that's out there. Like I think his channel should have thirty thousand subscribers. Like he's fantastic. He's a he's a very nice guy too. Reached out to me after I yeah. did a Lionel Dalton video, but um, he did a breakdown on Shamar Bridges. So check that out. Um, that's that's great. pretty much the extent of what I have. But I saw some guy. I saw a guy that uh, looked really physical, coach. Yes. Yeah, do you have anything yes. on uh, Bridges? Similar, similar to De Devon Williams in some ways, if you ask me. Even though Devon Williams' stats are obviously not very good at Oregon, but Bridges, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I thought he only played like four games last year, maybe five at Fort Valley State, and and I'm quite sure. Correct, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here too. Fort Valley State's in in Georgia. Georgia, so, Georgia. Yeah. I just found that out. I had to look it up. Yeah, so they're. They're, I'm sure they're playing more than four football games every year, so I don't know what the situation was there. But big body, the video that EA did, maybe you can link it, or I'll I'll link it in the um, comment section if you want once you post this up. Like it showed a physical guy. He reminded me of Devon Williams. Didn't look as athletic as Devon Williams. Of course, I mean Devon. For those people who don't know, Devon Williams was like the number nine ranked athlete in the Coming country. Out of Cali, right? From yeah, and he was he was the number one ranked athlete. In California, I mean, I mean, athlete recruit, not not a receiver, not a court, but athlete, and he was like number nine or maybe ten in the country. So incredibly highly ranked recruit ends up at Oregon, and I would I would compare Shamar Bridges to him in some ways. I think Williams is a better, a more physical blocker, and a guy who uh, I would call a George Pickens light in some ways, and in, in terms of blocking, I thought Bridges was way better downfield than Devon Williams, though. Okay. Okay. So again, I don't have a lot to go off of with them. So this is going to be a short one, but, um, you know, for, for bridges, he obviously, video was great. He has video. He has video was really nice. And the, the, yeah. the good thing is when you, well, with Edgar Allen, I know that he's focusing on the correct things. Like he doesn't cherry pick and try to push a narrative when he sees something over and over again, those are the types of plays that he highlights. Right. So, um, I, you know, I respect Edgar already. Allen on that. And he's in, in bridges signed already. Yeah, he's 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 he signed, sealed, delivered on the field. Um, but yeah, no, uh, it, I mean, we've got him for three years. Wait, he's he signed a right. contract for three years. Yeah, so and Polk he, hasn't signed yet, right? No, Makai Polk hasn't signed, and I don't think uh, Bolden hasn't. I don't. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't think Bolden has either. The Those first guy the they signed was that. Bridges. The first guy they signed to a contract was Bridges, I believe. And you know, I could be wrong there. So that tells us something. You know, a they see his ability. And, and, and again, they're looking for that bigger receiver, you know, and structure that bigger, they're looking for that bigger body. There's got to be a reason why, you know, there's got to be something that they're planning offensively for that reason. I personally, and I, this is a different belief than some people have, and that's no problem is uh, I personally believe our passing offense showed tons of progress through eight or nine weeks last year. Yeah. The Miami game was an Obama and, and that's what made the Miami game. So, um, frustrating because we had seen so much progress you know but but in any case i digress go ahead no i mean it, it was a different type of passing offense there's over routes i know you did a video on it but that was something i was talking about during the season it was just so beautiful to see those incorporated mm -hmm. um you know and then it seemed like when sammy got hurt they went away if i'm if i'm mm -hmm. thinking about right and then they started to come back later but um but yeah shamar bridges big guy six five but for the viewers out there not just tall and slender this guy's got some mass to him as well yeah. and you can catch some of his games folks uh on youtube if you look up fort valley state versus uh they were uh you know there's a lot of game footage unfortunately he missed a lot of games so it's it's tough to find footage on shamar bridges uh the last comment on him coaches he was one of the names i believe it was coach t t martin brought up and said who's standing out to you be like 
Okay, yeah. it's Shamar Bridges through the first week of OTAs, and he I thought that was one enough. practice. I thought that was. I thought that interview was after one practice. Maybe it was after one week. I don't know. But. Yeah, I thought it was. I thought it was after one week, but I'm, gotcha. I'm not sure. Okay, so the last guy we're going to speak about as we're wrapping up, getting close to the hour, uh, Devin Williams. I say Devin. I'm not sure if it's Devin or Devon. Oh, and at the end. Um, now, this is what sticks out to me, Coach. I'm just going to go for the overall view. He's 6'5", 210. His arms are long as hell. I mean, it's 34 and an eighth inch arms. That's what offensive some offensive tackles would love to have yep. that. Some guards would definitely like to have that. I see him as a as a tight end. I really Maybe do. Could be. Could be. I know he's physical, and I know he's. I know he plays angry, and I know yes. he blocks well. He's an X. Yeah, you know, he's an mm-hmm. X. Now you know. Again, the same thing against Pol- or, uh, in terms of Polk or other guys. Like, is he going to win, you know, against press man coverage, against a number one or number two corner for the other team? Right now, no. He, a, he's not going to see that coverage. B, you know, he, we're talking about all of these guys generally. We're talking about them developing over the course of a year or two. And, yes. and, and some people – actually, you'll, you'll probably be the main person who doesn't like this. In some ways, these guys, as we keep them or whoever we keep, they need to be looked at as like a James Prochet. I think James Prochet's career trajectory, if realistically, if you look at it right now, he had 16 catches on 20 targets last year. He had two games where he looked really, really good, and this is related to Devon, Devin Williams. I'll bring it back if I can. There is clearly the opportunity. Let's say the floor for – what's the floor for James Prochet this year if he gets consistent playing time? 30, 35, 40 catches is the floor, if you ask me, if he's given yeah. opportunity. That's the James Prochet is not going to give us 21 catches on 28 targets if he plays every single game this year, 25, 30 snaps a game. He's going to give us 30, 35 catches, something like that. And that's a that's your trajectory if you look at the stats. 16 catches last year. He's he's built. He's climbing the ladder. To me, these UDFA guys, Devin Williams will be one of them. You know, that they might be a year behind Prochet in terms of that ladder. Their ladder may not go up at as steep of an angle. But um, I do think there's ability there for all of them. I like Devin Williams. I really like him. I got two games on him against Oregon, Oregon, um, Oregon State, I think, and excuse me, and one against Utah. And he was pissed off against Utah. I didn't see the Utah game. That, that's cool. I'm going to watch that. So I'm going to write that down. But yeah, I, I agree with you that I think that he could play an X, and I think it's worth mentioning that special teams is going to be important for all mm-hmm. these guys, and physicality is uh, one of the first things. You know, the speed I'm not overly worried about, Coach, because you know usually the Ravens will have a couple of burners on the outside of their coverage right. teams, and then you know a guy like uh, Devin Williams is big enough to where he he can play like the Chris Ward role or something yeah. like that the christian welch role where he's closer to the kicker and go down yeah. there and coverage because you know d- despite having justin tucker coach harbaugh likes to play games and and tries to get that forced fumble on the on the you know mm-hmm. when the, he's kicking off the teams uh so yeah they they like their their guys but um i want to go over uh a couple of things that caught my eye with uh devin williams first of all uh, despite his lack of explosiveness, his quarterback, Anthony Brown, is also on the Ravens team. Right, right. And the reason I think that's important is because there's some natural connection with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that when things are going bad for Anthony Brown or things are moving fast, I should say, for Anthony Brown and some of these uh, you know, practices, they're going to be playing on the same second and third teams. Right. That Devin Williams might get a chance that the other guys won't get because of that camaraderie. Mm-hmm. Um Back shoulder throws. I saw him extremely effective on back shoulder throws. Uh, his catch point. Very advanced on that. Advanced. Yeah, man. I mean, he's like picking up the ball and he's able to sell it and have those late hands and the late reaction to Polk really. Two. Uh, Polk, too, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Polk's just pretty damn polished on everything. Yeah. Um, catch point, hands. Uh, with Devin Williams, he will be covered, Coach. He will be covered. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's going to be blanketed at the NFL level. So for him, it's all about the 50-50 balls. I think that playing with Lamar will help him, obviously, because of the coverage. We've went, went over a bunch already tonight. But, um, yeah, I kind of see him. Uh, X is a good spot, I think, for him to develop into. But if I were to use him this year, it would be like a big slot. It's kind of like how I wanted to see them use Miles Boykin, which right. is a guy that you can – have find space in the middle of the field in between linebackers and safeties, whatever you want, however you want to part can block on these running plays 
and just be kind of a menace, a big target, and a guy that you can target between the hashes is where I would see him if he gets active somehow this year and gets some playing time on offense. I kind of see him as a between the hashes type of guy, Coach. Mm -hmm. Do you see it any differently than that? I mean, I think he's got the ability to do that. There's no question about it, number one. Number two, and and this might go, well, macro or micro, I'm not sure. Uh, it might go in the, in the opposite direction of where we're headed, is I think you look at the catch radius of most of the guys Lamar has been throwing to in previous years, and that may give us a little bit of a hint as to why we've got all these big guys coming in. And so to to connect that to the question or the point that you just made, which was a good one, is you know Devin Williams, Shamar Bridges, Trayvon Clark, Mackay Polk, those guys have the ability to give Lamar. We look at some of these plays, and there's times where people say, why isn't he throwing the ball? Why didn't mm -hmm. Lamar throw that football? Well, how many times has he thrown the ball to that guy with coverage that tight and that player caught that football? Yep. I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but Lamar does. And there are times where the quarterback knows, okay, these guys have not caught this ball against this coverage that Mark Andrews has, you know, or, or maybe Bateman has now. And so giving him a larger catch radius, it doesn't mean a damn thing about his accuracy. That's not what it means. It, it means that the Ravens are saying, hey, we've got to give him a larger target to throw to because the coverage that the Bengals are – the Bengals' coverages are great, flat out. The Bengals' coverages are good. The Browns have much better coverages now. The Steelers, you know, I don't know what they're going to do under this new D.C., but generally they're very multiple. You know, they can play cover three, cover – they can play anything. With Tomlin's and, still there too, so the right, overall got, philosophy. Yeah, they got Flores now, you know, as a defensive uh, assistant, I believe. So I, I think I think that what we're looking at is guys, Devon, Devin Williams, who could be X, like I mentioned. He could play in the slot, certainly no question. You know, I don't, I don't think there's any reason why he can't. And he could block anyone. The guy blocks like a, a terror. Yeah. Yeah, it, you know, and you know, if Carrie and I, Carrie Stevenson from Deep Cover, brought up the, the exact same point. You look at Marquise Williams, uh, you know, or Hollywood Brown, Marquise Brown. Mm -hmm. You look you look at Miles Boykin, who had the size, uh, both of them when it came to catch radius downfield uh, for different reasons, but basically throwing a 50-50 ball downfield for different reasons. You did not want to do that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Hollywood obviously just had some, you know, some size limitations. Uh, you know, Miles Boykin adjusting to the ball, getting bullied to the sideline, not really looking back and giving the quarterback a clear indicator of where to throw it, uh, that kind of thing. Lamar hasn't had that. So I've always had that question, yep. Coach, as far as is this a weakness or something of not only want to say weakness of Lamar, but is it on Lamar not taking a shot? Even Duvernay up the seam, Coach, you see him running up the seam, and I can't figure out whether he's in the progression or not or right. if Lamar just doesn't trust to lay the ball up to him. And because Lamar is very good at managing the game, if there's seven yards to Andrews there or a 50, 50 ball to Hollywood Brown, he's not going to take that shot right. uh, and, and give it a chance that, you know, he's going to keep it on schedule and hit, hit a boil or Andrews or somebody over the middle, yeah. and just take what's given to him. So it'll be interesting to see with some of these guys that we talked about tonight, whether that expands. I mean, like this was talking about with Devin Williams, that back shoulder throw was money, bro. And we haven't seen yeah. that from Lamar. No. Uh, it could be a real weapon for him. Bateman showed a little bit of it. Uh, so with Bateman and maybe one of these other guys like Polk or Devin Williams, maybe that's something that can expand our passing game just to even a little bit more this year. I agree. It's a, and I think it's a progression. I'll try to, and I'll, I'll talk about Brown for a moment and I'll use that as hopefully a jump off point for some of these younger guys. You're, you're talking about 50, 50 balls to Brown and, and there's a way to do it that gives the quarterback an opportunity and early in his career, he would just run it right up the sideline or not, not right next to the sideline, but you know, and then if you remember the Tennessee playoff game where we went down to Tennessee, we beat them in 2020. There's two balls that Lamar throws over Marquise Brown's outside shoulders, right shoulder in both cases. Brown's route took him kind of in towards the top of the numbers, and it took the defender in there too, and it gave Lamar that sideline to drop it into. Now, it's right. not saying that Marquise Brown never made those catches because the catch he made against Arizona on a third down in 2019 at home was unbelievable, and it was an unbelievable throw by Lamar. And to our point, which I think we're both trying to make, these bigger receivers, A, give Lamar a bigger target area. You know, B, they don't have to be as precise with the leverage of the defender as Marquise Brown did. And we're, we're certainly not denigrating Marquise Brown because I think he got better at that from 2019 to 2020. 
And, mm-hmm. um, and I think these bigger receivers, they're going to be behind in that progression, possibly in their understanding of it when facing elite defenders. But some of them, and this is where I'll separate um, Makai Polk from some of the other guys. He played in the air raid system. They threw the ball, I think, 72% of the time. I might have my numbers wrong there. Yeah, it was so, ridiculous. Yeah, so, so he has more reps, period. Uh, who's the guy? Was it Wes Welker and um, the, the guys? Yeah, Edelman and um, Amendola. Um, didn't all three of them come from Texas Tech, or, or was it two of them? I couldn't say for sure, but yes, yeah, but they I, text. But it's all, it's all like all Mike Leach's system, you know, all Mike Leach. So they caught thousands of balls. Mike Leach is playing every week. It's first guys to catch like 2000 footballs. And that, you know, so, I mean, that's an insane amount of footballs to catch every week. So to me, some of these guys are, I think Polk is probably further along in that progression of understanding where to be. Uh, but Devin Williams certainly has got the athletic background. I can't rank them all. So please don't ask me to do that. I hope we keep four of them, and I hope that two of them make the roster, and I hope Makai Polk is one of them. <laughs> me too, me too. I, you know, Bolden is the one that sticks out like a sore thumb because he's not like the others, mm-hmm. uh, and he's accomplished uh, from a you know from Alabama. So, um, just you know, that's he's a little different. Other than that, I figure like especially when you add in a Benjamin Victor who we didn't talk mm-hmm. about tonight, who could also fit in this category, who does fit in this category of big receivers with something else to offer. Uh, there's going to be one, I would say at least two of these guys are going to be on the practice squad and they're going to stay on the practice squad. Yep. Uh, you know, they're not going to be picked up by other teams. They're going to be our guys in our system. So whether that's bridges, whether that's Victor again, whether it's Devin Williams, uh, Tra- Trayvon Clark, I mean, there's, there's some options here for the Ravens coach as far as they can kind of just wait, see if they want to start the season with five receivers uh, because mm-hmm. they want to keep an extra tight end or whatever, they can do that and still have two of these guys stashed away, ready yep. for them when they want. And there's a game. There's the you. I think you alluded to it, or you alluded to it earlier, but you were in the middle of a different point. There's the game within the game about who they keep. You 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 did specifically mention it with with Bolden. Is you know if Bolden, keep him, right. someone else going to try to sign him? And that's certainly possible, especially as you get further into the season and people have, you know, teams have injury problems. And now they look at a guy and they're like, OK, well, we had this guy highly graded. And for whatever reason, we none of these guys was drafted. I think that's the key. Uh, I do think uh, and you can speculate on this with me if you want. I do think that in a typical year, of course, who the hell knows what a typical year is now. But in a typical year, I think that it's possible that two of these guys get drafted, maybe three. OK, yeah. Who knows what that is anymore? I'm, I'm with you. You know, yeah. they could just keep coming out like they have been. But, uh, but yeah, Polk should have been drafted, in my opinion. Bolden should have been drafted, in my opinion. And then I look at a guy like, uh, you know, like Trayvon Clark. I think he would have been drafted if not uh-huh. for his, 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 you know, his, the his game, measurables. The you know what I mean? The game, yeah, the game within the game, you know, Trayvon Clark's, if we keep him, no one's, you know, no one's going to probably pick him up. Slade Bolden, right. they probably are. So, as you as you mentioned earlier, there might be a situation where we keep certain guys because we know that we're going to be able to keep them for two or three years, and hopefully develop them. You know, now some would say, what can they actually develop into, Coach? Well, I don't know, but you know, so, unfortunately, some of those questions come from people who don't watch the amount of film that you do, that I do, and that uh, certain other guys do that are way better at this than I am. And so, like when someone asks that question, "What's he going to be capable of?" It's like, well, go watch the film. Go watch the film and see what he did against SEC competition. Go watch the film and see what he did in in a bowl game two years in a row. So, because because a lot of these guys have put some damn good stuff on tape, and I uh, I get a little defensive. You can probably hear it in my voice when someone who's played at a Division One level, you know, their skills get denigrated. Um, you know, when they're on a pro football roster in a pro football training camp right now. So, no, I mean to me, there's all there's all for the most part. If you're on an NFL roster, there's something you can do at an NFL level. Yes, and you know, thing, it's, it's, at least yes, at least one thing, and you know, I could, I we, we went over some of those things for every player tonight, what we think they can do. So, um, yeah, I mean, they could all help you in some kind of way. They all do one or two things at an NFL level, and, and that gives the Ravens the flexibility to say, hey, we want this guy for this, we want this guy for that. Right. Maybe, maybe there's an injury, uh, you know, preseason, and we're we're lacking in one particular area. So it's one of those things, Coach, where this is a, a group that I'm excited to see how things play out. Uh, I think that it, it has less to do with them. Well, I don't want to say less to do with them. It always has most to do with, 
you know, their commitment, what they're showing. But the guys in front of them, you know, what are we getting out of the guys in front of them? Or what are we not getting out of the returning players that we were hoping for? Yes. Say, damn, maybe Tylen Wallace isn't doing this for us, or maybe Prochet isn't doing this, or Devin Duvernay isn't turning into this. Well, one of these guys can accomplish X, Y, and Z for us if we yep. if we if we use them. So, so um, a lot of moving parts, I guess, is what I'm saying, Coach. And it's going to be exciting to watch this group and uh, whether it's we add or not. Yeah, now. even even though we don't get to watch them, it's already exciting. Go ahead, Jason. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say I still have more to watch on them. And uh, no matter who we add to the receiver room uh, through free agency or trade, these guys are still going to have a chance, Coach, to stick yes. on this team. And if they're not playing this year, you look at next year. One of these guys or two of these guys are, are going to be on this team next mm-hmm. year, probably on the roster, I would say. Yep. Yeah, we could we could look at you know career proje- uh, projection or, or the climb. You know that I just tried to make the comparison a little while ago about Prochet, uh, and it applies to Benjamin Victor. You know as well so some of these guys are a year one year behind him correct me if i'm wrong he was his first year with us was last year well his first year with us was last year i'm not sure how his contract works because he was in the nfl with the giants right, before right, that right. So, so i'm not sure but to, to your point what coach is trying to say is you can restart the clock with one yes, of these guys exactly. and have them for one more year so that puts a guy like victor behind exactly. the eight ball if you think you're getting a similar player in yep. polk or clark you could say, oh, well, sh- shoot, we got Polk or Clark for an extra year or two than we do with Victor. So, so yeah. Smart, smart roster planning, if you ask me from that standpoint. And, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm certainly – obviously we're all aware of the conversations that have happened about the, the positions and the relative strengths of each of them. Uh, we're in a good place because we have a identifiable weakness. It's like a, it's like a boxer who has an identifiable weakness, and now you've got to, A, work on it, or B, address it or or maybe you know to use my analogy go get a new trainer who can train you different that would be acquiring a new player you know that could be the case i think these guys the the, the returning guys and the udfa guys are being given an opportunity now to prove themselves and prove what they can do and if it becomes to a point where they you know they look around the room or they look down the line and they say okay none of these guys gives us the two or three things that we're looking for at the same time then it becomes time to say hey, we, we might have to look at acquiring someone so there you go. Gives the Ravens time. It gives the Ravens a lot of time and a lot of reps to go around mm-hmm. uh, long season. So these guys will have their chances. Uh, and, you know, I really like Coach Williams. I really like Coach Martin. I think that the Ravens are smart investing in those guys to try to mm-hmm. develop their own receivers. So it's about time for this organization that we start developing our own receivers. I would love to see Coach uh, Rashad Bateman. I hope he realizes like on the inside, what he could be in this town. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I don't know, you know, him personally or what his goals are, but, um, you know, for a person like me with my mindset, if I'm Rashad Bateman and let's say I'm playing for the Raiders, you know, I'm not invested in the team at all. Say I'm drafted by right, the Raiders. Right. The Raiders have never had a drafted their own number one receiver. They're always signing Derek Mason, Steve Smith, San Juan Boldens, like, uh, Rashad Bateman could be a flat out hero in this town. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? He produces, he signs, he wins a Super Bowl. I mean, this will be one of the all time great favorite Ravens. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rashad Bateman has that chance. He's got the game for it, too, man. He's got the game for it, the intelligence, the attitude. The, and, and I don't, I'm old, you know, so I'm not a huge fan. Hey, of we're the same game. age, coach. Yeah, yeah, I know, back I know. off it. Back off it. <laughs> I'm not a fan of like new words, and this certainly isn't a new word. He has. He has swagger, but there's a better word than swagger. There's a there's a better word there. It's he's got a confidence about him, Rashad Bateman. Um, and that drop, I, I watched his reaction to his drop last year against the Chargers that was intercepted, the slant. Mm-hmm. And I watched his reaction, and I, I will admit to this: there are times where I watch a player's reaction to failure, and I make an immediate judgment based upon their react, not the failure, not the not the mistake. Not the technical mistake, physical. I don't make. I don't judge that. I judge the reaction to it. And Rashad Bateman, to me, his reaction to it was like he knows that's not him. Like he knows that's not him. And I never saw that mistake repeated. And you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I didn't see drops out of Bateman. Other than that, did you? No, no, I didn't. It, that kind of uh, that kind of uh, mentality. That's what I saw in Justin Herbert before mm-hmm. that draft. Mm-hmm. where it was like I saw him make a bad throw and he almost like kind of laughed it off. And it was, 
it was like it kind of reminded me of Jonathan Ogden. I remember one time he got beat. Kyle Bowler did something stupid. The other team recovered the end zone for a fumble. And Ogden was just like laughing. And, you know, at me at that age, you know, I was kind of an angry young man. I'm like, what the hell, Ogden? What, you know, yeah, you yeah. know, taking this game seriously or whatever. But Ogden's like never in a million years is I, have I been beat like that? Like, right. What the hell just happened? And there yeah, I saw special. that with there's sorry, something sorry. special, like, like with Herbert. You know, it was like I think one of his first throws at the combine, it was a bad throw, and he was just like, Are you kidding me? Yeah, I'm here in the first throw. Like, he wasn't worried at all or stressed out at all because he knew he was going to show out after that. That's right. And that's what I got from Bateman on Bateman, that yes. drop that turned into an interception. He's like, That's not happening again. Bateman, I'm good. I'm Bateman, good. Bateman is like, I think Bateman is a very versatile and, and he's a receiver. So, like, you know, he's not going to run the football, but he's a versatile receiver in, in that. You know, he doesn't have to run this type of route to be effective. Now, I do think there's there's certain types of routes that he is better at. You know, I do. I loved – you know, nobody's going to like the beginning of this state, statement. I loved in the, in the late third quarter, fourth quarter against the Dolphins <laughs> when we went trips to our right and Bateman set to the backside one-on-one. We went over the top to him. Yeah, well, we, I mean, I, I did a live the stream. out and up? Well, it was multiple routes, Jason. Yes, the, it was like an out and up. It was like bent, you know, you drew it with your hand just there. It was like a, a little out and up kind of. Um, he, he beat him on a, he beat him on a speed out. He beat him on a slant. Same, same, you know, maybe not the same corner, but same essentially formation. Singled up backside. Bateman, to me, reminds me of the 6'2", 6'4", guard at your, local basketball court who nobody can guard, you know, and you can put him over there one-on-one. But I, I also think he can fit into a team structure of, of, you know, two receivers nearby each other, like twin sets or whatever. I think Bateman could be good at any damn thing they give him to do at receiver. I really do. I think he's a, you know, potentially all pro receiver that we lucked into getting. But I guess it's not luck when your your clear cut strategy every year or two out of every three years is let's figure out a way to get two first round draft picks, you know, which we've patented that move now, and uh, thankfully we got him. Hopefully we, hopefully we address his desire to be great with the you know the appropriate amount of targets. I'm not talking about force feeding, but hopefully we address the ability level that's there. If you had a all pro caliber running back and you were a passing team, you would certainly recognize, let's get this guy at least 220, 240 carries or some, or whatever that number is. Right, and, right. and to me, the same thing applies to Bateman, and it's not a selfish thing. The guy can freaking play. We want him to be successful. We want his talent to be recognized because he's that good. Let's get him 120 targets at least. It's, it's there for him, Coach. I mean, Marquise Brown had that. The 8 to 10 targets for Bateman. You know, on in a heavy volume passing game is what I would expect. You know, of course he's mm-hmm. going to have those games where he only gets six targets or whatever. But um, you know, I would expect that to be the next step. I would be extremely disappointed if Bateman wasn't well over 100 targets in a 17 game season yes. where he's healthy. I mean, that just would not. I would be. I'd be wanting G Row to hell out of here because you you got to maximize your talent. And Bateman's the kind of guy I said with Carey. If you give him Hollywood's targets, I think fans will be pleasantly surprised, even those who are high on Bateman, with the results, just the numbers, uh, you know, the results, because Bateman can do more. He can do a little yes. bit of every. He can do everything. Yes. Uh, he, he, as good as Marquise Brown was at some of these dig routes and how sharp he was as a route runner, stuff he did at a very high level, his speed up faster than Bateman. I think that Bateman can do all of that, but he can do more. Than Marquise Brown. Yeah, I no, totally agree on all of that, and that's not, and that's not either one of us, you know, running down Marquise Brown. That's just recognizing sure. the talent that is there with with Bateman. He's a little, he's a little bigger. I think he's more versatile. He he reminds me of a of a person that I actually know who was a combo guard in high school, like a six four guard and six five guard, and in a state championship game, the point guard got hurt. And he had not played point guard in the three years he'd been on varsity, and they. You know, the quick the coach looked around and said, "Hey, you're the you're the best option here. Let's use you as the lead guard in the last quarter and a half because it happened mid third quarter. Guy guy brings the team home and they win the state championship. And 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 my comparison there, which you know hopefully is a good one, is Bateman is capable of doing a for most of the season or most of the game. And then at some point they say, "Hey, we need you to do B because 
of whatever reason, and he and he boom does it because he has, I think his his umbrella, his tree of skills at the receiver position, receiver position is very wide, and he right. he's not, he doesn't have a limited focus. And we're not saying that Marquise Brown had a limited focus, but the things that Marquise Brown, his tree of things that he was good at, I think was that tree wasn't as wide. You know, right, you didn't want to run him into the teeth of the defense. Mm-hmm. You had to spread it out and create some space for him or, or allow him to create space right, for himself right. in a big area, eat up grass. But uh, Carrie Stevenson and I were actually talking about this uh, the other day as far as, like, I, he he's looking for another receiver that can man that X spot aside from mm-hmm. Rashad to be able to move him around and create the mismatches for right. some of these teams that play their corners on the same side where they have one guy who's in the slot all the time. Like as Ravens fans were spoiled with the quality of corners, the, you know, the emphasis yeah. we put on them. We got Marlon that can travel. Like you can't get away from a great corner on our team. Other teams aren't as blessed. So if yeah. there's a weakness on another team where we can res- line Rashad up on that guy and have somebody else to at least be able to hold down the X spot, man, that would just open things up. I think tremendously for the offense. I'm just, yeah, I agree totally. I'm, and I'm not just excited for, you know, for him to get to play a full season healthy, number one, but <clears throat> him to get to play a full season healthy with a competent offensive line. Don't want to sidetrack your show because I know you, you know, you got a distance. That's all right, man. No, nah, we're we're good at this point, man. But there, there is legitimate, real. I was talking about this with, um, I was actually talking about this with EA earlier and saying, um, I go back and watch the film of last year. And, and and the first eight, nine, ten weeks, whatever, I'm like, how did we even accomplish some of the things we accomplished with that offensive line? I'm not going to name names. There's no reason to. That would be disrespectful. But you know, certain things you look at, you're like, Jesus, we are not even able to give Lamar the requisite time to get back here, get in his progression. And he's and, and I always talk about layers of rush. You know, some teams use uh, different layers of, of pass rush, depending on the athleticism of the quarterback. And he would have multiple layers of rush. Like, so like maybe the right mm-hmm. tackle, maybe the right tackle is beat at, at pretty bad depth. So Lamar's got to move up. The problem is as he moves up, there's someone else beat at a different level or different layer, or different depth at the left guard position or whatever, whatever it was. And that totally destroys the flow of a, his progressions and B the receivers trying to work their routes. The routes don't become cumulative because the setup routes that were run in the first and second quarter, he wasn't targeted. So now the the the, the left hook, if you will, of the routes, you know, with the early routes being the jab and the cross, the left hook is not there because we never ran the, the jab and the cross, you know, successfully, you know, because of the offensive line. It was a cumulative effect and um, still shocked, to be honest with you, about how effective Lamar was through yeah. uh, through those 10 or 11 games. He was he was playing out of his mind with that because, like you said, they, there was quick pressure off the edge, and then the interior O linemen were uh, often dying a slow death. At least, just you know, not giving a lot of room to step up and yep. comfortably be able to throw. So Lamar was throwing from all kinds of awkward angles, mm-hmm. uh, arm angles, and then having to to just you know kind of sail the ball instead of like driving through the ball. Uh, he played out of his mind, uh, you know, especially that first, you know, eight weeks, I think, before the bye. And the Minnesota game, man, I, I mean, I, he had a lot of great moments. So the sky's 90, the limit. 98 snaps. You're talking about Bateman? No, I was talking about Lamar. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 98 snaps, 22 rushes in the Minnesota game. That's Lamar. Like, and then four days later, he's got to play in, in Miami. You know, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, really, really. He has an unbelievable amount of cardio when when completely healthy. That was stretched to the limit in that four day stretch, and I don't think yeah. that's talked about enough either. You know, is is that you know we're playing you know five states away or six states away, whatever, and you know he just played ninety eight, one hundred snaps, you know, four days earlier. Yeah, and, and two big game two that bait. went into overtime, and then yeah. you know you're playing on a Thursday night, and then you see the the cover zero, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and and it. it Nobody was prepared for it. It was just a nightmare. And then, uh, you know, I think it was the very next week, wasn't it, that uh, mm-hmm. he got banged up. So I think I think Bateman, you know, I think Bateman, it, it, I'm going to make a prediction and I, and I could be wrong. I think after three weeks this year, Bateman will be on like a ridiculous trajectory as far as catches, yards, touchdowns. I do. 
And what I, and makes I, you say that? And, and because I don't think people realize how good he is, and that includes me and you. Like okay. I think, I think a he's injured. He's out for the first five games last year, maybe six games. Mm-hmm. What was what was the Chargers week six? Yeah, I thought it was week. I thought he was out for six games. So something like, yeah. this, something like that. Yeah. And I think, and I think that even when he did return, he was not like he didn't get his fair share of the of the pie of the offense mm-hmm. consistently. And I think that that will happen now that he's been with the team and he'll be with the team presumably until week one in terms of preparation and everything. I think it's possible he's going to get out to a fast start and then the coverage will change to him. And so, because there's going to be a, a leverage and an accounting and an awareness of Mark Andrews on every play. I there's, see where you're going with that. So early on when all the attention's going to Andrews or a lot of attention, of course, will be Bateman lights it up. The other teams have to adjust. And that's right. And that, that's when the games begin with as that's far right. as the, the uh, coaching games. There's no so, reason people have already, you know, people have already solved the puzzle supposedly, right? They've already solved the puzzle. You either play quarters, rush four and, and, and play soft quarters against Lamar, or you go blitz zero, bring heavy pressure, make him throw the ball quick. Reduce, eliminate his ability to scramble. All we have to do is beat people once or twice on that coverage, the second one I just mentioned, and it will no longer be utilized as much. And Rashad Bates yeah. is the guy to do it. Now that yeah. now that reduces your paradigm of the coverages that are available to you. I think it's going to happen. I think I think he gets off to a hot start, and the coverages have to change or be simplified that we see, which only helps Lamar. Well, Coach, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Um, you, would you like to, at the end, please talk about your work, your channel, that kind of thing as, as you wrap it up for us today? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. It's probably the, talking about myself is probably the thing I do the worst. So, but well, you yeah, know, you give it all, a shot, man. Practice all 22 films on, um, on YouTube and, and on Twitter. I generally, to be honest with you, only just try to share my content and, and comment rarely on Twitter. Just don't have that much time. I appreciate, you know, people subscribing and checking out the channel if they wish. Just put out a Ben Cleveland video um, a day or two ago, something like that. Prior to that, a, a, a J.K. Dobbins video, of course, you know, film limited there to 2020. Check it out. Um, I hope, hopefully have uh, another video coming up on Ravens offensive line. I'm not going to reveal who it is uh, by Monday or Tuesday. Uh, trying to focus on the offensive line a little bit and, um, and, and see what we think we have there with a couple of guys. So appreciate you right. letting me do this, Jason. And I'm always humbled when I get opportunities like this. So I uh, thank you. Man, thank you, Coach. We'll be doing it again. And um, I'm hoping it's Tyree Phillips. If you're going to do a Ben Cleveland video, you better do a damn Tyree Phillips video because we're going to have to look at this left guard situation. Don't say anything, Coach. Don't don't ruin it. But uh, that's my prediction, early prediction here. So uh, All right, man. Uh, with that, Coach, I just want to say thank you to my football family. Love my football family. Appreciate y'all. We have a tight community here. Uh, easy to work with all the guys. We are uh, helping each other get better. So when you see Coach on here, you see the deep cover guys on here, you see all just a variety of people on here helping each other learn more, giving us other things to think about. And uh, that's what makes the Ravens community really special, in my opinion. Other teams don't have it. Go ahead and try to look and do your own work. Uh, it's not the same thing. You don't see these mm-hmm. kind of collaborations. So we're lucky. With that, Coach, I want to say goodbye. And uh, say goodbye to the people for me, Coach. Yeah, man. Honestly, Jason, you're you're a part of that, to be honest with you, because your your mentality and the way you approach people, number one, is personable. You treat people like a person um, and, and not just an object or not just someone who has a, maybe a similar and or different opinion from you. From what I can tell of you, it doesn't matter to you whether a person has a similar or different opinion. You treat them the same. And I think what you're referring to in ter- terms of tight knit community is 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 formed by people who approach things the way you do. So you deserve credit for Thank that. Thank you, man. Thank you. I've, I've noticed, uh, I'd like to think I made a difference in that area because it wasn't necessarily like that a couple of years ago. And when I see everybody working together, it's just, it's beautiful, bro. I mean, we, there's no need to compete, man. We're all in this, we're all love the team. You know what I mean? It's, it's, uh, I can learn, you're, you're better off learning from everybody. And man, yep. I, I just feel lucky that everybody has that in them, man. Some really good people around. So thanks for the kind words, coach. Yeah, man. Thanks, man. Appreciate your time. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. We appreciate you. Give Coach a follow. All the links will be below. I'll try to remember to link Edgar Allen's video on Shamar Bridges down there as well. Mm -hmm. Football is family. Good night, guys.